for all of you guys that are on on channel hi i'm mary behind the chair i'm the founder of uh of behindthechair.com and this is Anko Tran. I don't think you need an introduction for my audience. So <laughs> we are so excited to have you here. But I'm going to just tell you a client story and then we're going to jump in. So for probably ever my whole life, I um, had long hair. It was always like kind of one length. There was a little bit. And everybody, I kept saying, I want to cut my hair short. I kept saying, I want to cut my hair short. And, um, and then I wanted to do like a shag. And everybody, I remember a hairdresser that had known me for a really long time said, you're not right for a shag. Your personality is not right for a shag. I think everybody got my personality wrong forever, you know? And when I cut it into a <laughs> shag, I started to feel more like myself. And finally, um, when Chris Jones cut it like completely off, cause he like, Gianni Scumacci cut it in Britain, uh, in the UK. He was the first one to cut a lot of it off. And then Chris went one more step. And I've never felt more like myself in a head of hair before. And so for everybody that's out there, this is the first time I've actually really felt like this is what I was supposed to look like. So that- um, I love it. Even though I, love it. I haven't gained the quarantine 15 yet, but I have gained the quarantine 10, so. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Is that pounds yeah. or kilograms? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. You know, in college, in college, they say the freshman 15. Well, I've gained the quarantine 15, so. I'm like, I'm, I'm getting it off. I'm like, keep saying, like what I did during quarantine, I did not lose weight. I did not stop eating. And I needed social distance from my refrigerator. So, and that's not important. <laughs> so, I look, I check that at every 15 minutes. You what? I check my refrigerator every 15 minutes. Oh, you do to make sure it's okay? <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, are you okay? Let me grab you something. Are you feeling warm? <laughs> oh, grab me something. <laughs> so good. How are you? First of all, you haven't gained the freshman I'm, 15 or the I'm, quarantine 15, but talk to us. Tell us how you, how you doing, how you feel. Mentally, you know, taking that I do travel so much. I mean, I'm, I never home, as you know, like you, I, I'm just, and you too. I like yeah. not being home and, and, and having, you know, I just moved to a new place and haven't re really stayed in this new place for a while. And I actually got a chance to like organize, get rid, you know, get rid of things and organize my closet and all that stuff. It feels so good, but it's going on like a month and a half, and I'm still not crazy yet. But I mean, I'm still keeping really, um, just you know, keeping busy with things like you know, doll heads and stuff like that. As you know, I have so many doll heads friends, and <laughs> that's the only thing I think. If we don't keep our um, yeah. hands going. Yeah, you know, I was thinking we, about that. Is that true? The dexterity of your hands is an issue if even after a month of it's not like the bicycle thing, or is it truly what? This, the, the physical dexterity you think is potentially a problem after that period of time? I don't think it's so much of a problem that it hurts anything. I think, I think, I mean, I, I, I love doing hair. It's my passion. So for me, doing hair is like getting, you know, getting familiar with my my hands and my fingers again and just getting that you know because yeah. i don't want to go in and rusty and all like shaky and stuff like that but i just want to re um you know, exercise it's like exercising your body yes. it's like exercising your hands so same kind of deal and you know i i love that urge because yeah. i love what i do so that's yeah. why I, I you know play on the doll heads i don't mind but i think so, it's very important so so today i wanted we're going to talk a little bit about um, the virus and how that's affected your salon. Obviously, you're a, a, a quite a, um, not only are you um, an incredible hair cutter, you have an incredible salon and, and um, you've been responsible for helping people on Instagram so much, your whole team. I mean, you have a whole, you know, you're, you're sort of the father of, of, um, of Instagram haircuts, no question, of the, of the lob. But you're also a father of like, I feel like teaching and mentoring in a new way. And I, I think that's really so important. And, uh, and I'm so excited. So you guys that are going to be on social climbing um, on Monday, on going to be with us. So he's gonna be talking about that as well about being a salon owner and how it's so important to engage your young stylists about not only doing hair, but learning how to take great pictures on Instagram, because that's how we market ourselves mm -hmm. today. Um, but the it's other true. thing we're going to talk about is, uh, is your story. And you have an incredible story of survival that probably so many people don't know about. And um, it's probably when you and I had that conversation at the BTC house, I remember one night when we were together, like reading, you were reading like my horoscope things and what signs and all of that. Cause I know that that's, that that's really important, but you've, you've survived some pretty extraordinary 
experiences in your life coming over from Vietnam. So, um, so I want to I want to do this two part. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with you guys in California and how you're thinking about it and how you're preparing. And then we're going to we're going to talk about your story because I think it's so powerful. So tell us what is happening and how are you feeling about what's going on and what do you think this new normal is going to be when you do get back? Well, right now, I think everything that happens to us, especially in California, every day changes. And then now that I just read up about it, just to make sure that um, my facts are correct, that every county is different now. So every day, oh. every county changes. So now we're all into different counties. And then since I travel, and I do travel to New York, and I do travel to San Francisco yep. and Miami, when I do travel, and I have to make sure that this is like far in advance, that I have to look at what county they're in and make sure that it's okay. So not just the state, but you have to look at the county because every county is going to be so different. And that's for us. That's California. And that's how it is. It's like every single day it changes. So as far as it goes, I honestly really don't know what's going to happen because it's just going to be so different every day. And I, But I have to keep on the news. I have to keep on what's going on with the governor, you know, um, talking to us all the time. Every time he goes live, it's very important to know, you know, as an owner. Um, and, and as far as coming back to, um, work and also teaching, we're taking precautions, like as far as like wearing masks and I even bought like a, a thermometer, a, th a thermometer, 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 yeah. <laughs> thermometer yeah. to, to measure your temperature, because I think it's so important, like to know that, you know, measure your assistant, measure me <laughs> and then measure my, you know, clients or my students yeah. when I actually do have classes. All that stuff is so important. And then, you know, if gloves need it, you need to provide those things. You need, as an owner, you need to provide those things for your employees. So they come back, they feel secure, and also for your clients. If your clients wants to wear a mask, provide the mask for them, yeah, you know? And it's, I think it's very, it's to make them feel safe, for them to come back and be like, oh, okay, you guys have all the things that needed so you guys can um, be reopened. Yeah. But you know, all these things are so different. It changes all the time. But like we're stocking up on those things and then sanitation, right? Wiping things down all the time. And I'm my assistant knows me. I'm so anal about like cleaning, oh, are you, anywhere <laughs> you know? So... Oh, I'm, all, I'm yes. I'm already, yeah, cleaning, cleaning crazy. But now I'm just going to have to do every other client. Like or, I mean, every client, Yeah. like my third assistant is going to have to start cleaning more. But that's just the way it is. And it's, we have to do that. And I think that's the new norm yeah. until we get more information because right now there's not enough information, like you said. And I know, I know that you guys, you guys have actually have a great information on your website, by the way. So if you guys have any, you really, you really, really do. I know just checked it out before we, uh, and it's like, it's really, really informative. And it's like, I think as hairdressers, we don't really know, and there's so many information out there, it's hard to well, filter think, out what's what. I think what. that what we realized is like, people don't, like, it's so scary. There's so many words, you know, to, oh, a deer, hey. There's so many. I know. Um, <laughs> hi, guys. Um, there, there are, I feel like we need to be that place. And so when this all happened, um, and this, I mean, our, we went on our, our own internal lockdown where our team, it was a sad day. Like, everybody picked up, it was, I haven't even shared any this uh, with anyone really is on it was uh, the week it was on Friday actually it was even on Thursday after our New York show and uh, we were originally supposed to stay and do a big meeting with L'Oreal for all of their VPs of education for every single department and right after our wow. show was over on Monday things got really like we had 800 people 850 people I think that came to our show on Monday and all of a sudden things got really weird on Tuesday like we were gonna stay until Wednesday or Thursday and all of a sudden there was this, like everybody was so excited. And I'm so excited that we were able to get together. And then all of a sudden something happened. And by the time on Tuesday afternoon in New York City, all of us started feeling unsafe. Like all of us started saying like, we need to get out of town. They were starting to close. It was just so weird. So that Friday, that Thursday, actually two days later is when we gathered our team together and said, okay guys, I want all of our young people to fly back to their hometown. So um, we're gonna let you guys fly home. We're gonna work from home. And um, it just, we didn't know if the country was gonna go on lockdown, if they were gonna stop allowing people to fly. We were trying to get one of our team's sisters home from Rome. Like it was just all of a sudden. Wow. So we were able to shut down, because as I said to my team and they're watching and they know I say scare and prepare. So 
Mary's going to scare the shit out of you. And then we're going to prepare. <laughs> and then, and then when we're prepared, we can then help everybody else prepare. Do you know what I mean? So our editors literally stopped writing about hair about yep. three or four weeks ago, well, five weeks ago. And literally all they do is write about each one of them has a different segment. And all they do is write about is write about trying to help hairdressers save money, new ideas about how they can make money you know, um, giving them all kinds of tools and then the disinfectant downloadables and things like that. So um, we, and then again, as I was just sharing with you, we had a big story come out in Allure today, which we've been trying to get the government or the press or anybody yeah. to start talking about what's going on in our industry, not just the restaurant industry and everything else. So we were super excited. There's a huge story that just came out and, um, and our statistics are heavily quoted. So I want to thank all of our hairdressers that there were over 20,000 of you guys that filled out these surveys and that information really helped us get this really big story in Allure today. So um, this is how we can do it is by gathering together all this information to do it. So, um, so you were yeah, afraid I, to go back on? Are you personally afraid I love that, I love that um, article. Oh, good, thank you. Yeah. Am I personally afraid to go back? Um, no, I'm not. Just because I, 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 you know, if you know your precaution, you know, and then also, you know what to do as far as like washing your hands a lot. And like, I always wash my hands every kind. That's like my spiritual routine. Besides sanitation wise, I wash my hands every single client. I just do that just because energy wise, I, because once my client's done, I wash my hands. I almost feel like a, a clean swipe. And then you go into your next one. Because the minute, the minute you have like, you know, the stuff from the old clients, because you're touching the head. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm very spiritual in that sense of like, you know, you, you bring it on to the next client, stuff like that. So when you wash it, you're almost washing everything away. And then you start cl clean with the new one. And so, so that energy, you know, so you're also washing their energy away and then being, yeah. and then up, having that, cl that clean energy for the next client coming. I love that. Yeah. It, I've never heard you talk good, about Good that. or bad. Yeah. Oh, I, I think, cool. I think, I think that, I, I think more now, I'm more spiritual and more outspoken about that because I think I went to Bhutan at the beginning of the year and I'm just like, I, you know, I've always been a spiritual person. I just never gotten a chance to like really, discover, you know, explore it more and discover it more and I actually don't know much about it. That's why I didn't say much about it. But now I'm getting to know more about myself and about the spiritual connection. It's, it's, it's important because yeah. we're not just hairdressers we're giving, we're feeding them energy. So if we're negative and we're like mad about something and we'll just snap on them, you're giving them bad energy, <laughs> you know? And it's not like all rainbows and unicorns when they come in. It's just like, give them a good, fair chance, you know? And if they're in a bad mood, you want to wash your hands. So you're like, oh, you're taking in that bad mood because this is what we do. Besides that. doing hair, we're exchanging. You know, you they know, want you. A lot of people come in to see us, yeah. not just great hair, you know. You know, what's cool is, um, you know, um, most of the people know that I had a pretty big struggle, um, uh, uh, mental health struggle last year. And I've been pretty open about it because I think that it was, um, it's important, uh, you know, that we, that we do talk about it to work, you know, 80 hours a week for 30 years. And then uh, last year, you know, and a lot of that was, you know, I see on my social media, um, you know, are you running to something or running away from something? So when you're working so hard, are we running to something or running away from something? And I think for a lot of my life, I was running away from something. And uh, unfortunately, that was my, my little girl that I was running away from and some of the trauma that I had when I was a little kid. And I went away to a place called Onsite uh, and Onsite changed my life and it changed my thinking in so many ways. And one of the things um, that their founder said, and we're going to have him on actually uh, probably later this week, uh, he was sick. He got very, very ill um, and uh, ended up in the hospital. So, um, but what he talks wow. about in, in, I actually had him open my show in, uh, in Nashville because they're right outside of Nashville. So it was a really powerful way for a cleansing kind of in a sense for me to have that our, have that show last year, the last show of the year in the same city that I was, you know, doing two weeks of intense counseling uh, without my phone and everything. Um, and he came and spoke and um, uh, for just a few minutes, but it was really powerful. And one of the things that he was talking about is how hairdressers are just like counselors in the sense that there is a whole secondary um, sense of um, uh, stress that we get and trauma that we get from our own clients. And they have they have so many classes and teachings that they do when you're in college going into into that into counseling 
So when you're learning to be a therapist, there is so much information that you get to teach yourself how to not, how to distance yourself from that trauma that your clients give you. And that's one of the things he's going to come on and talk about and mm. the program that we're trying to put together. So we can not only talk about mental health issues, but also talk about how you're able, the techniques that you can use to distance yourself from the trauma and the, the stress that your clients give to you, whether you even know that it's happening. So it is, it's, he, yeah, exactly. He, Hazel, Hazel saying healing the healers. And um, that is a program that is so important because you guys are owning this from your clients every single day. And uh, I know that some of you probably thrive on it, but you don't know how much it's taking from you as well. And your job is to try to give that good energy back to them because it might be the only time that they get touched in a week, a year, a month, or a month or a year, you know? So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. <clears throat> and it's, you know, you know, you brought up a really good question of like what, or, or what, what you experience is like you work so 80 hours a week and then like, what are you running away from or are you running away from yourself? It's like, yeah. I can speak the same because I was running away. I'm not running away from anything. I was having major guilt because having major guilt from my parents that they have sacrificed so much for my, for, for me and my family yeah. that I feel guilty if I don't work this hard. So that's a whole immigration mentality though, because I wasn't born here. I was born in Vietnam and we can go into that later, but like, yeah, it was a full on guilt and I can go with that later. And, but no, no, let's for go. me, it was full on guilt. Yeah. Let's talk about it. No, but I mean, it's, it's one of the things let's, I mean, let's talk, let's talk about that because I think that it's important. I mean, let's go there. Cause I think it's important to talk about, you know, when you, because I remember you telling me that one time about feeling guilty because of how hard they had to work. But tell us, you know, we know you for this amazing hair cutter and Instagram and everything. But tell us, tell us about where you came from and some of the struggles that you went through in your life because they are pretty incredible. Well, <laughs> let's let's. So I've been doing hair for twenty years, and um, and and. You know, and you're like 30. It's a very long time. <laughs> you're like 30. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, and I was born, I, I was born, let's go back into time. I was born yeah. right before the Vietnam War ended, which is 1974. And the war ended in 1975. So we, it, it became, the whole country became communist. And we fought against the communism and stuff like that. And we didn't want communism. So we're from the South. I was born in Saigon. And during that time, I remember my parents were like, oh my gosh, there was incidents where they would throw grenades into people's home to get them out. So therefore, to get those people out so they can arrest them. Because when the North invaded the South, which was you know communism, and they took over the North, and they went down South and took over the South, and that's when um, the whole country became um, communist, they would throw grenades and they would arrest people who are against the communism or who is a descendant of Chinese. We have to change our last name. Our last name is actually Chen, C-H-E-N. I'm, I'm gonna share a lot of things that you guys really don't know about. And I just, you know, it's really, I thank you for, you know, having me on about this, but um, we have to change our last name. Our last name used to be Chen, C-H-E-N, and we're Chinese descendant. We're, uh, my great grandparents were born in China, um, and during the whole Cultural Revolution there too, when it became communist. So my great grandparents escaped communism, and went to Vietnam, and then had my parents there, and then my parents had me, and then they escaped Vietnam because it turned to communism. So we're not big fans of communism, just because we're such survivors we we work really hard we you know do a lot of things that just help benefit things and you know um you know you know the environment and 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 economy wise and stuff like that but like when it comes to communism it's just like it's just not fair you work your heart and then you know it just spread upon you know we can go into i don't want to go into that but like we escaped that twice and that's called um, socialism right just to FYI. <laughs> that's called socialism <clears throat> you work really hard and, and nobody else gets to benefit from it. Keep going. <laughs> um, so we escaped in the middle of the night in 1978, 1979. 
like in a fishing boat. So um, my parents three, were fishing. This was three years after on the war. So 1974, 75, th four years after the war ended. Yes. Uh, um, so you four years that, after the war ended. So they did live in communism then for those three or four <clears throat> years during that time. Yeah. Wow. Wow. We 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 got we got a lot of things taken away. We got a, like our rights and everything taken away, um, and yeah, it was really hard. How I mean, I I was so young. Then? Oh gosh, mm, I don't know. I would say forty, maybe in their fifties, forties, forties. Okay, so so they no. so they were older. Forty for, late forties. So they yeah. were older when they had you. My mom had me when she was 46. Oh, wow. Do you have brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. I have mm, technically nine brothers and sisters. Oh, so you're one of the youngest then? I'm the youngest of 10. So they must, so your brothers and sisters must have some big stories about how their lives changed as teenagers and everything. Yeah. As well. Because you wouldn't remember <clears throat> am, most of this, right? No, I don't. I don't remember nothing. I only, I actually don't remember anything. I think it's, I think it's because of the trauma that happened. And um, I'll tell you guys what happened. Um, so we left um, on, in the middle of the night because we were fishermen. So we know about like fishing and stuff like that. And, you know, the, um, the committee of boat and stuff like that. We have to leave in the middle of the night, escape among, well, I think we had about like, a hundred maybe a hundred people on board in the fishing boat because everyone wants to escape and stuff like that and it was overfill and filled with people we were on the boat for like a week and a half, maybe a week i think wow. i don't know i really exactly because my brother and sister they don't remember, they remember certain different yeah. things but like i am going to write a book about how this whole you experience should. um so, and then we got rescued by um, an Indonesian government and then later on into Malaysian government or is it, and one, and then we got put in a refugee camp for like a year. Um, and Wait, I so think where, where we were, you, you got to Malaysia, you said? Where did Indonesia. You say? Indonesia, okay. Indonesia. They, they took us in, they gave us refuge and um, they gave us, um, food and stuff like that for a year and then we got sponsored by a church in austin texas wow. and that's how we came to the states and i am forever grateful for the church in austin texas i mean i think there's always it's i'm so happy like i remember the first day that i remember that so well because when we land into um austin texas they approach us and gave us a bucket of church's fried chicken. And they're like, welcome to America. And I will forever remember that because I freaking love fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, that's why I'm like, I'm like, God, I love, love that. And then I, I was just a little boy. I think I was like six years old. So I came to the States in 1980 and sometime in August, like I was six years old and we have nothing on our backs, like nothing. We have no money, no nothing because we have to flee the country. You know, and I remember we were, they would help us so much. And then I would go to church every Sunday. Um, I was in choir and I, I, I'm probably, I don't remember that because I'm probably a bad singer. <laughs> but we go to church every Sunday and I know a lot about Christianity. I always, I, I, I always, I've always been so open about religion just because I feel like religion, if you take the core of it all, it means there's a lot of goodness to it. You know, it's not like, because we all have our own interpretation to things and that's how we feed our own, you know, yep. um, ideas into it. Um, but at the core of all, it's just, there's a lot of goodness to it. So we went to church and my parents were open too. We were, we were raised Buddhist, Buddhist, but my parents like, you know what, these people are willing to, to um, help us out, sponsor us, the whole family. And it's like, that, it's, it's amazing. I and mean, we could have, you know, not be, I wouldn't be here. So. On top of that, like living in, they gave us housing and stuff like that. Living in a four bedroom with like, I don't know, God, I would say seven siblings. Um, and, and, and plus my parents, I think there was like 11 of us. I would sleep in my brother's bedroom, my sister's bedroom. I would sleep, like I would share beds. And 
and that's how we would do it yeah. like so that whole survival thing has always been ingrained in me and i remember how much how hard my parents work like to in order to earn extra money they would leave in the middle of the night i think i was sleeping with my parents until i was 12 years old wow just because there's, there's no room yeah. we don't have any room yeah. i have to sleep with my parents yeah. and i was the youngest oh. so i slept with them until 12 years old and then um they would they would leave in the middle of the night. I'm like, where the hell did they go? You know, and they would go around the, each neighbors, digging in the trash to get cans, to get aluminum cans, to get um, you know um, bottle cans, just to earn some extra money to um, you know to help us out, because there's a lot of mouth to feed. So um, that's the thing that I will never forget. That when I when I looked out in the window and I saw my parents and I would because they wouldn't do it in the daylight because maybe they were you know maybe they felt embarrassed or they don't want to for us to see that you know yeah. um so but they do what they can and and the fact that my parents risk all of our lives they did they they really risk all of our lives be even getting on the boat oh. because that boat can sink <clears throat> because we have about like 100 people on that boat on a boat and that should have happened. during that how many should that be on that? I don't know. Uh, much less than that. A much, much less than that. In a week, that. you have a bad, then, a bad storm, and it's over, right? That's how a lot of people die. Mm. And a lot of people die from pirates. Because off the coast, there were pirates that would rape the woman, kill the kids, throw the kids off the boat, and um, kill the men and take the gold. Because during that time, people don't have, people couldn't take, um, money because currency wouldn't matter they would take bars of gold or whatever they have jewelries and stuff like that and they would flee the country and they would they know that those people have gold and stuff like that so they would you know intercept that and then rape them and you know kill them and stuff like that but we were lucky because my parents were fishermen and they know that so well because they know the moss code so you know when you like when in the middle of, i don't know how that goes like is it moss codes i don't know but like they flash lights, meaning like, you know, the certain amount of flashes mean certain things. Oh, um, so um, if, code, um, what's that called? Morse, yeah, Morse code, you're right. Morse code, Morse code. not Morse code, yeah. Morse no, code. No, no. When, um, when you said thermometer earlier, I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what you were saying. I thought it was something new that I'd never heard of before. But you know, <laughs> no, no, when we were talking earlier today on the phone, I was like, what are you going to put in this on? <laughs> okay, never mind. I don't want to. I don't want to take. I don't want to take us off of our journey because it's like such an incredible one. So, so they know that, and then they flash it, and then that's why we didn't get caught with oh. the pirates. Because if we did, we would have been gone. There's so many lost souls outside of the um, the the sea in um, Vietnam because they the the pirates. I don't know the pirates can be from different countries that they know that the, you know, people are fleeting. And that's, it's really, really sad. And we were one of the lucky people that were, um, you know, got saved. And mm -hmm. I, I thank you higher being all the time, you know, to, to have me be here all the time. So it's just like, and, and going back to like, having that guilt, Mary, it's like, that was my guilt forever. And it still is, I'm dealing with it all the time. Like, that's why when I'm laying around, especially now, just watching TV, and I'm like, it's not like I feel so guilty that I'm laying around watching TV. Um, it's that I do need to rest. I can't work 60 hours, 50, 60, whatever it is. And then eventually, you're either, you're either going to get sick. If you don't have your health, you can't. You did your parents no justice. Or I did my parents no justice. If I get sick and I, you know, pass away, whatever it is, it's like, I did my parents no justice. So for me to like keep on, um, you know, keeping myself sanity up here and then, you know, practice what I do and love what I do. And my one thing that my parents always teach me is like, I think at the end, like having 10 kids, they're like, you can do whatever you want. I think they don't pressure me in, 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 in such of like, you should become a doctor, you should do a farmer, you know, all those things that, you know, usually Asian parents like pushes their kids to do. At the end, they're like, I was in fashion before that. And then I went to hair and they're like, do what you make you feel, you most feel happy because they understand happiness really fulfills your, um, you know, 
your life and your career and your dreams. So I, I really appreciate that my parents gave me this. And I, sometimes I just think about it. It just makes, gives, gives me so much tears. They're no longer with us. I mean, with me anymore. I mean, my, pa my mom passed. I don't really talk about this too. Um, I miss my mom tremendously. And I think I love her so much because she helps me become who I am. And especially um, all the stuff that happens in um, what we do, I don't become jaded because she's like, whatever you do, never lose yourself. If you're, if you want to fight for the good, if you want to do things that really makes people happy, then you need to do it, you know, do it for the passion and the money will come with it. Okay. And I think that's one thing that she always like, Great. because she's seen it all. She's seen where they, you know, we were doing fine in Vietnam and then we were, went to Vietnam with nothing. So they've been through all that stuff. We've been to like, you know, we were on food stamp. Yeah, like, that's what you had shared with me before. We had to, you know, and, and do what you'd have to do. And I think this is such, you know, I, I'm glad that I went through all these things for me to understand, like, I don't take things for granted. Mm -hmm. Or at least I tried not to because it's hard, you know. I, every single day I have to remember, like, don't take things for granted, you know, and don't take people that work with you or for you for granted because it's like, you know, they're there for you and you're there for them. And it's like, it's, it's good to help other people out. What kind of lessons, but, like how, how did your, that, how did, how did the idea that your parents were free and then they weren't, you know, in communism and that struggle, how did that manifest itself in your childhood? I'm super curious about how, like the lessons that you were given almost unconsciously um, because of that. You know what I'm saying, right? In terms of how they were they. Well, I'm just going to leave it at that question. How did how did those lessons or what they dealt with? How did that manifest in them that that during that time afterwards, knowing that they had been free, and then communism took over, and you had you had a good life, and then you didn't have a good life, and then you had to flee. That must have felt almost like like impossible you know do you know what yeah. i mean like how could this happen yeah. to us um how did that affect them long term and then ultimately you i think affect them long term because i mean it affect them in so much different ways that they my 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 mom and dad somewhat became like you know um if if, if let's say that um a blow dryer came in a, a nice box. They would like want to save that box uh, just because they don't know what happened, you know, or they just, they just start collecting. So then my parents would be like, that's such a nice box. I'm like, I oh, know mom, <laughs> just <laughs> we can throw away. And they're like, no, we can use it for something else. And then I became like that. I, when I move from my other house to this house, I have so many stuff that I'm, that's why packaging and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, this is such a waste. Like, why are we like, send in this like amazing box that you can't recycle and that now we have to throw away. I'm like, I can use this for something. And I'm like, okay, I'll use it for something. And I end up putting it away and I'm like, oh, this is a nice box. And so, you know, my, my parents became somewhat of like a gather thing just because they don't know what's gonna happen. You know, and that mentality still runs into them because they live until like 40 something and they're like, oh shoot, now we have to flee the country and now I have to take all of our kids away with us. And there's a chance that they all could die on this boat. But it's a chance that we have to take because we don't want to live in communism. And that's what they did. And I, I, you know, full on respect for them, for them to do that. It's just like, it's crazy. It's, it's one thing that a parents, I wouldn't, I, one day I will I become a parents because I would love to be a parents. I don't understand that yet, but like, Man, that is something that's oh, just so gosh. beautiful that so I respect. So many. And your children. parents. Yeah. 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 You know, it's funny because um, a lot of the people that have lived through the depression, you know, my, um, my mother-in-law would like literally take, she's a lot older than, um, than my, than my parents. Um, yeah, really almost another generation older and would like literally take green beans that were left over and put them in a hairspray, like an Al, an Alnet like hairspray um top and then put a little tin foil and that she would save them at every dinner that we were at like didn't matter 
but always save them because even though she didn't go, she was such a little girl, like just barely, but her parents were the ones that so close, were so focused on that, you, that, con that conservation. And I grew up super poor as well. I certainly didn't have to take a boat over, but I had an outhouse until I was five years old. And my parents, you know, definitely had to mm. ration bacon when we were little, we lived you know, in a house that um, most people, you know, probably wouldn't live in when they were really little. And and I had to watch my parents, you know, struggle forever. And we had a black and white TV until I was 18, which again, in another whatever is nothing, but like they refused to get a color TV because they just, they had the money then because my dad became a self-made millionaire after working 18 hours a day, you know, for my whole childhood. But he was making $60 a week fixing hydraulic jacks, trying to feed a family of four on $60 a week. And um, so you learn those lessons. I lived in the middle, I, I, my country house is, um, is only about 30 miles from where I grew up in the middle of nowhere. I thought that cornfields were in between every town. So when I got to the big city, I didn't even know, I, I was waiting for the cornfield to be between one town to the next town. And I'm not kidding, actually, I, that's how, I never, I wasn't on an airplane until I was 16 years old. So, I mean, it was, um, we were poor, you know, we were poor, we didn't have much, but you know, they, but they gave me that work ethic that um, has forever uh, been in, ingrained in me um, that it was, you know, my job to be successful. So it's interesting that you say that because we haven't had that, com we had that conversation once about you telling me, I remember at the BTC house when we were at dinner one night about your sense of guilt, but I hadn't really, I think that was before I went, I went away, I call it, I went away before I went to on site. And I suppose there's maybe a part of that in me as well. Um, because you, you know how hard your parents work to just get you to this place. And, you know, my, my, uh, my dad never went to college. My mom, you know, went for a little while, but you know, at 19 years old, they had two kids, babies, and they had to feed them. So, you know, a lot of your dreams that you have kind of go out the window when, you know, when, uh, when you've got to take responsibility and you do take that responsibility. So, mm -hmm. so once you got, um, so they did that. What else about, so your parents though, not wanting to live in communism, they had strength underneath of them to say, I don't want my children to grow up in a country like this. And the fact that they brought you over here, um, is again, it's pretty in incredible. What other things did you learn aside from hard work? And um, did they expect you to sort of fight for your beliefs in the sense of, um, you know, being willing, not necessarily to speak out or to speak up, but just that, again, that strength. Because I think so many of us in the US, we just expect everything to just always be exactly the way it was. And I think that this, this whole situation, including on me, I, I felt like I was going to wake up one day and it would be over and it'd be, we, everything would be fine. I really like, I'm embarrassed to actually say that I actually believe that. Um, but it's not right. It's things are going to change. And you guys, you know, your family definitely experienced that in a pretty profound way. Um, so, yeah. so you go to school and how did you become a hairdresser? Or how did that all happen? You, you're in Austin, Texas, you're growing up. I, I was in Austin, Texas, and then we we actually moved from Austin, Texas. Um, we were there for like a good six years or so. Um, and I really don't ever say this another story about why we moved from Texas because, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think back, back in the days, um, it was 1984 or 85, no, 85 or something like that. Um, my brother came home with his head split open, and I think that was that was i love texas and i, I think it's it was not, just a situation it's not texas's that, fault by the way okay <laughs> it's not texas fault it's just it's such a situation that happened and my brother came home with his head split open and there were guys checking chasing after him with a pipe wow. and Why? what I, did he do wrong yeah i don't know I, I i i mean asian is that I'm, what oh vietnamese yeah yeah i think it's because being asian but it's it's nothing about text. It's just about people. I you know things. The whole thing about things like that. It's just people. People, individual, are responsible for their own individual. It's not about nationality. Awesome. It's not about you know. It, it's not about a, a state. It's nothing. Nothing about that. It's individuality. It's like everyone is responsible for their own self. And I love Texas. I still go back. My 
brother still lives in Texas. I love Texas, but we have to we have to go. And then we went to the court and stuff like that. Nothing really happened. Oh. Um, so my brother has a big old stitch like this much on his head, and it was like at that time we're like, my parents again. They're like, we need to take the kids out. We need to leave. So we went to Southern California. I don't really talk about that because I don't want to be like, oh, sorry, on um, like I don't. I'm not looking looking for petty. No, you I, know, it's I, just I, just I, happened, and my I brother. Understand. I understand the, um, you know, we, we had, we had a whole group of, uh, refugees of Vietnamese refugees that came into my town and my little teeny town, 30 miles from here. And, um, you know, I, I don't like to look at groups as groups, like what you just said, but I feel like yeah. I've never seen a harder work, a harder, a harder working group of people who felt so incredibly grateful. Um, for everything that they were given. And they were literally given, you guys, I mean, as a, as a group, you were given the opportunity just to move to this country and some support maybe when you got here, but you, everybody did it on their own. And I have so much admiration for that. You know, I haven't met uh, anybody from Vietnam that dealt with the same kind of thing because I've met several people because most of them did come over that way, right? Because they were refugees um, that I grew up with. And then on um, you know, some of our nail technicians that we all know and love and, and um, use. And, and they're so, they are so grateful to the United States of America. They're so grateful to this country and they all work so hard. So it's interesting, um, you know, when, you, when, when we talk about different groups and stuff like that, it is one thing that I will take the whole group together and say, I, I've just always experienced that from the Vietnam community. So there's something there that yeah. I think is in Brendan that people do feel very, very thankful for being in this country which I, I, of course, love to hear. It's the American dream. And I think that's one thing that I would strongly believe in the American dream and would never want to take that away from us. So that's why we have to, we're land of the free. And I strongly, and everywhere I travel, you know, as much as I love everywhere I travel, I love Paris, I love like Iceland, I love Japan, all that stuff, but I come back and I get so happy because it's 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 we're, we're there's so much things here that is so beautiful and so wonderful that I you know appreciate and sometimes we need to leave it in order to see what we take or, it for granted or, or hi Mark this is how are you love you too um I think we have to hi Mark we, we not only have to see it I mean we not only have to leave but we also need to hear stories like this and I think it it is really important to understand that we are the land of the free and we need to try to keep it that way as well. And I, I think that's where, you know, some of the scary stuff coming in right now is you've got so much, and we're not gonna talk about the politics because you and I talk, we've no. dealt with that enough, right? No. We're dealing with it no. every day on the news. No. <laughs> but it is why yeah. it is so important that we need to listen, like we need to look at everything going on and then we need to feel like we need to educate ourselves. And I think that that's the most important thing for sure. So tell us, why did your family choose um, California? What, what was it about California that made them say, we're gonna go from Texas to California? So Southern Cal, because my cousins live there. So it's okay. my mom's sister. Okay. So she lives there. She's like, come over here. We have a whole family of community and stuff like that. So we moved to Southern Cal and to Westminster, which Westminster is basically the biggest, the second biggest population outside of Vietnam is, oh. um, is in oh, Westminster. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and um, we were there. I remember when it used to be like farmland, like, and now it's becomes, it, it's like a city um, and stuff like that. So we moved there and um, I lived there ever since. And I moved up to LA probably about like maybe 18, 16. Yeah. Maybe 16, 16 years ago, um, 16 years ago. And um, that's, you know, it's, it's, and it's a really long story to become a hairdresser. Like, how did that happen? Um, I wanted to do fashion. I've always no been a there. huge fashion, no fashion, fashion person. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> I love fashion I so know you much. Do. Um, and <laughs> so I went to fashion school and I, um, my, my parents, um, um, you know, encourage me like, you know, if you want to go fashion, then go ahead and we make sure that you um, do what you really want to love. Went to fashion school, went to FIDM and then graduated and then worked for, um, uh, whatchamacallit, um, a sportwear company. I, I did pattern making. Oh. 
So for those of you guys who don't know pattern making, it's, it's basically if all the shirts and all the t-shirts are made from, you know, to, to mass produce, you have to put on paper and it's cut in, you know, a bodice or whatever it is and sleeves and stuff like that. And then from that point, you grade it into different sizes and then, then you cut it out and then you sew it up. So pattern is basically, um, you know, patterns where people can make different types of sizes and stuff like that. And I used to make patterns for that. And, and patterns, you have to be so precise, even an eighth of an inch or a, a one sixteenth of an inch will make a big difference because no. if you grow, really? yes, if you, if you grade a size from a size small to a size medium and you miss a sixteenth of an inch, that means you, you're grading as often to a large. That means someone's, someone's shirt's going to be so much bigger. Like once you get to a, a larger size or a smaller size. So it's so precise. And I love that. I know I, I maybe I've always been so like um, anal retentive yeah. about all these things. And I love all that stuff. <laughs> and then I, I did that. And then I mean, and then I, when I was um, in, in working, I was like, huh, like I always watch fashion, one, you know, runway shows every Saturday morning. And I, I don't know if you remember this, but they used to have um, fashion shows every Saturday morning. And I think it's called Fashion TV back in the 90s. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm 40. So I know exactly, yeah, and I know who produced it. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. And I used to watch, gosh, Naomi Campbell, yeah. Kate Moss, Linda Evangelista, Claudia Shelford, like walk the runways. And I'm like, oh, I love the hair. I love everything. I love the whole aesthetic, you know? And I'm like, huh, maybe I should go for hair too. I love hair. And I'm like, might as well liking it and stuff like that. And, um, <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, I went to school for it. And then... Um, it just everything that happens in my life it just land into it just it just you know it just i don't know it just paved it ways into well, what it is now so then i went to um hair afterwards and then here i am now and um yeah it's hair. it's that's no. the mess of it <laughs> do you are do you do you do you wish that you had carried on well maybe not today but fashion's gotten so like boy it's just been one thing after another and in how fashion has been so affected by Instagram, by now obviously this, and it's just, it's incredible what's happened. Um, they were the first ones to take yeah. a really big hit in Milan, you know, this year when they couldn't do, I mean, that's when we all started like, on the beauty side, I feel like that's when we all started going, oh my gosh, like this can shut things down and then Kosmoprof shut down. And then, and it just was one, you know, one thing after another for sure. So when, when you started here, like, but I still want to know, like, fashion to hair, like what you woke up one day and you, I want to be a hairdresser or somebody was a hairdresser that you knew that you say, Oh, or you were watching their hair walking down the runway instead of the clothes. Like <laughs> what was it that made you, that made you <laughs> um, decide to do it? No, no one in my family does hair. Everyone in my family is pretty much either a business person or, um, and then we used to own a fish market. Um, so they all do restaurants now. So they do restaurants and stuff like that and, um, um, different types of business. Um, but it's always business for yeah. them. And yeah. I always, I'm the last one and very creative and they're like, let's do this, let's do that. So when it comes to hair wise, I think, I don't know. I think they, I always look at the hair. I'm always like, oh, you know, the hair is interesting and stuff like that. And back in the days when you used to watch like John Paul Gaultier and like all these cool hair and stuff like that, I so inspired even like back in when um um mcqueen was on yeah like, mcqueen is my idol i love love McQueen. yeah me too and, and me too i know that's like that's what i wore on stage forever it was only mcqueen <sighs> like it was only mcqueen and then when sarah came i think that she did a great job like actually yeah. carrying that forward i really do honestly um it's always it's always you know and even marcus filed for bankruptcy um right now they're all going i mean it's just so sad so we have a neiman marcus we don't, and we have neiman marcus and Sachs across from each other and you know most of the time though i'm like wow, sh dur during my shows i'm shipping dresses right because i don't have time to go do that it's never but that's always the first place i go right is 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 um is alexander mcqueen but gautier still I, I i i was wearing a gautier dress the day that i met vidal sassoon so, um, and, wow. and I still oh. have that dress. I love that dress. And I wore it to an Aveda event not that Save long it. ago. And it's, I love that dress. It's my, it's still probably to this day is my favorite dress I've ever bought. You know, with it's, it's like all the, um, like, uh, like nylons, like women's nylons. What's the, what's the fabric called? That's all. And it's like, uh. it's so bohemian and I, I love it. Next time I see you, I'm going to wear that dress. 
because you can dress it up. Yes, and down. please. But Gautier was my I love favorite. That. When I was younger, Gautier was my favorite. And as I got older, um, and of course, obviously, he was even bigger then. And then McQueen became like, how not? Because McQueen's, McQueen's structure of being male fitting, like most of it, and I've always had so much more of a masculine side of femininity because of being a businesswoman and stuff, for sure. And that's why the shorter hair and stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm, um, I just always loved McQueen for those really strong lines, you know? And, yeah, and I yeah. Know, and now, now we're under fashion, but uh, here I'm wearing, <laughs> I brought like three things with me. I brought like, I didn't know I was going to be here for five weeks. I brought like three pairs of sweatpants, a cashmere sweater, a two BTC sweatshirts, and a couple of leggings. And literally, that's why you all see me every day with the exact same clothes on, because I'm not home and I have nothing here. So anyway, so then um, you started in hair and let's, let's walk you forward um, to um, when you, so then like, let's go forward to, to, uh, you know, like tell us when you really came on the scene, like when was it that all of a sudden, was it through Instagram? Was it through like, tell, walk us a little bit through your, through the past of your hair over the last 10 years, for example. When did you start this salon? Um, when did you guys well, start this salon? I, I went to. Um, I would go back. I went to beauty. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Got go it? Back okay, to cool. Beauty school. I, I went to beauty school. I went to. I went. Oh my god! I went. Um, this beauty school was like a hole in a wall. It was, you know, I went straight for ten months, and it was incredible. And um, I graduated, and then went to Tony Guy. Um, oh. I started at Tony Guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love, 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 and I love Anthony Muscolo. Yeah. Is me too. Right, he, uh, right. I knew, I knew that because I had uh, the award when I found out when you when you won. That's right. I cried. I cried. Oh. I, 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 he's my idol. Like he's, it's, he's amazing, 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 and he still is my idol. Um, and um, I went to Tony Guy for like a good five, six years, and then, um, then I decided to move to LA because either LA or New York and I moved it to LA and then I went to Beverly Hills and that's when I um, started at Gavatelier and that's when I start uh, blow drying, okay. doing all these housewife blow dries. And it's like amazing. Like, I think that's one thing that whatever your career takes you, it's just gonna, you, you, you're gonna pick up things, <clears throat> you know? And, and it's just like, it's, it's just, you learn from all that stuff that, you know, that you grow and stuff like in, in over the years. So I went to um, um, Beverly Hills and um, stayed there for like quite some time. And I'm, and then I opened up my own salon. And um, so that's, that's, I think that's uh, the gif of all. And, and I currently work with a really great company who um, it's Melbourne. Yes, I'm I know. I'm there. You know, we, I, okay. So, First of all, there, I we we had a meeting with them in New York maybe six months ago, something like that. I walked into their studio because they had their um, a lot of their artists in from Japan, and I was absolute. So first of all, I'm a giant fan of Japanese of Japanese hair right now. I'm a huge fan of it, and I walked in and they were doing the kind of hair that I have been like posting on my own. I didn't want to. I, we had meetings all day, L'Oreal. I did not want to leave and actually go to the next meeting. <laughs> I wanted to stay right there. And then I asked them, can I come back and watch these guys? Because they were incredible. Uh, there's just something about the creativity of all of, of this Japanese hair, especially where it's very PC, where they're really piecing it out, all the short hair, the yes. way that, and then the way that they're styling it, the, the lighting, the makeup. Like, I am so all about Japanese hair right now. You have no idea. Like, it's, <laughs> I've been so inspired. And it was all the same people. I was following the people that were in there, in the room. So if you guys don't know Milbon, you're going to be learning a lot about it. And I was so excited when I found out the fact that you were, like, literally now going to be running all of their, their creative and education in Aesthetic. the U.S. Is that kind of the big deal? Tell us yeah. a little bit, because I, uh -huh. what a great yep, decision. Correct. And and then right. like out of nowhere, there it is. And uh, I, I love that brand. I love that brand. What an incredible decision. And and you can be so uh, creative. You get to like do amazing. Mm -hmm. You're going to do amazing <laughs> stuff. It's not as commercial. Who cares? Yeah. It's just, it's not. <laughs> but it is. Like, yeah, but it's it not. Is. And... I think we can see that coming here. I really do. I think we can see that. I, anyway, I, I'm not excited about it. I am excited <laughs> about it. 
So tell us how you chose them. I love it. I just love it. You, you can filter it to, you know, co commercialize. Totally and again, the, the, the box, thing is like, when you, when yes. you look at, yeah, totally. When you look at runways, when you look at, when you, look, when you dress yourself, yes. like Mary, you, you look at McQueen, you're not going to wear the whole entire thing. You're not going to do the whole outfit, but you're going to take that aspect of you and make it yourself. And that's what's great thing about like, when I, when I teach, I'm like, guys, I'm teaching you these things because you guys are going to take it and make it your own. Yeah. I don't expect you guys to reproduce the same thing. And it's like, yeah. then what's the point? That's reproducing. That's like not you. So, you know, I, I, I decided to go with Melbourne just because I love, I love, I, I'm, I don't know, maybe in my past life, when I first went to Japan a couple years ago, I swear to you, I, I, as soon as I land, I'm like, wow, I feel like I used to live here. Maybe my past life. Like, past life. I honestly feel like I used to live there. Wow. Uh, probably. I felt the same way in Paris, too. Paris and, 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 and uh, in Japan, I just feel the same. It's so weird. But, um, and Japan, it's just like, I love the fact that everything is so clean. Everything is so meticulous. And, and maybe I'm so meticulous in that sense. I'm like, it is, oh, I like this. It is. <laughs> You're right because you, you do actually you do have that whole Japanese like the everything where everything is so meticulous and um, yeah it's it, it's really no I was I was thrilled when I saw that and there are people asking about Milbon it is one of the most it's what it's actually one of the largest companies in hair in the world it's just not as well known here in the United States so I'm sure that Correct. that will change with you at the helm doing this. And um, but yeah, it is actually one of the largest and uh, and they're incredibly well respected in all of the art communities in fashion. Um, a lot of the biggest hairdressers in the world uh, carry this line, work with the line, respect the line. Um, so I, I'm so excited once we all get back to work again uh, yes. to see what what you guys are all going to do. And, um, and I'm yeah, so excited same. to see that hair. I know. And, and hopefully one of these days <laughs> to see that Japanese team with you uh, at one of our shows. Because, oh, that work. I mean, it was crazy because it wasn't just like that I was walking in to their education center, which is beautiful, by the way. It wasn't just walking in, but it was actually not in the perfect light, not in the perfect light. They were all just working on their work, and it was stunning. And it was just the way that it was, the texture in the hair is incredible. It's just, it's just so different. It's, and and I'm so they They, they understand texture. Yeah. Yeah. And, and. Amazing. I, I think it's a good marriage. I mean, a good collaboration with them. I'm their global creative director. Um, and, global? You know, oh, my God. Okay. So I global. Know yeah. Global creative director. Global. So you are from I know. Japan now. See? There you go. <laughs> <I know. laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> not worthy. Not worthy. But, like, I, I'm so honored to be with them. I think they, they, they gave me a lot of good free. Like, they gave me freedom to do what I want to do. And then they trust my aesthetic. And I feel like. It's very in line because I, I deal with a lot of texture. I, I love texture and I love, you know, creating texture and doing different things. And I think that's, that's not in my DNA. I like, I like building a foundation. I think coming from fashion, doing pattern making and all that stuff and, and draping and stuff like that. And then being able to like kind of mess it up yeah. and just, you know, yeah. without saying the other word, like just kind of like mess it up and then just have that, you know, the foundation with the crazy messy thing and i love that con contrast between something that's so you know structural and then something that's so messed up that's yeah. sit on top of it or something i love that love that so yeah the, it's um and we i think i i'll post some uh, some of the work that i love uh, later today because i'm so inspired i have a whole i actually have a collection in my instagram that you know how you can set up your collections for what you like and it's all what's so funny is like they're, um, it's all just Japanese hair. So it's a collection of just all the Japanese hair that I love. And I, some of the color that, that they're doing, and it's like some of the color blocking that they're doing around the, around the face. And just, I just think that there's, there's just this step above in, no, I don't want to say a step above, because I don't think that's fair. It's a step different that's taking things that we, and it's very commercial. Like, it's not, it's more, it's, it's like edgy. There's, it's edgy, but the, cu the cuts yeah. are commercial. The cuts are commercial. Mm -hmm. But it's the edginess mm -hmm. of the color and the way it's being styled. And then, and it's, it is taking kind of that, um, 
some of the, the cool, um, um, oh, what do I want to say, the anime and all of these different things that have been, you know, that the Japanese have been so inspired by for over the years. And then like taking that and they're adding the way that they're adding color and the makeup and, but they're doing it in such a tasteful way. Cause I always say with one shot, that's the most, the, that's the one place you can go wrong on one shot pictures is taking your makeup and just make, there's a thin fine line between cheesy and not cheap, you know what I mean? And yeah. makeup is like one of those, those areas that you can just totally blow the whole shot if you just overdo it. And, um, right. and, and I just feel like they, I don't know. Okay, another Japanese yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've not even been excited <laughs> about, so... about how you're yeah, you're... but it's just, I'm just, yeah. I'm so excited for you. And I, I literally, when I Thank heard you. it, I Thank was you. just like, it's for the Americans that don't know about the brand yet. You guys are going to hear a lot, of, a lot about it and just check it out and start watching. Like I said, I'll post some Japanese stuff. If I, I always promise I'm going to do it and then I don't, but, uh, but <laughs> you should, but no, I love, and, but, I love it because I just think I, I think I want to, I want to say something was where, yeah, yeah. I, I, and one thing that I really want to tell you guys that, um, among this whole thing, um, when, so, they don't really do online orders. So if your client calls and um, to get the products, they're going to give the credit that the client goes to the salon. They're going to give it back to the salon. Oh, so, that's awesome. So that's really great. It really helps us because, you know, we're salon owners and stuff like that. It really helps us to be a flow. I mean, little, every little thing helps. Yeah. So if a client calls in and like, hey, I go to Ramirez Trans Salon, um, Blah, blah, and they give that credit back to us. Yeah. So they give it back to whoever, whatever salon it goes to. So it's been, I think that's really, really great. important. Yeah, it's been great to see that. We um, actually, you guys, for everybody watching, we posted a page that shows all the affiliate programs. So I don't think we have Milbon on that page, so yes. we should add it. But all Please, the affiliate yeah. programs that everybody has, um, and some of them are from uh, probably the lowest level is 20%, but some of them, I think Victory, um, Maddie Conrad's company is giving 50% back in cash. Wow. In cash, not in product, but in cash. Oh. So that's really, that's really, really cool as well. And you know, I, it's been, I love Maddie. Do you know what's been so funny too? I got to say this is, um, mm -hmm. as you know, that we launched um, ARC, our Japanese scissor line, which has been doing so well. In fact, it was funny because Chris Appleton, um, his bag was stolen right before the Super Bowl, and we had to message him over scissors because he's like, I can't cut without them. So we were just so excited that our scissors were there. Yeah. Sally Hirschberger, she wants them. She's doing something on Goop, and they um, they want us, you know, they they want them because now she's in love with them. We have a whole new series yeah. that have come in from Japan, so I need to send you a pair of them because they're incredible. Our series too, and um, and so. Um, uh, Thank you what yeah yeah i definitely have to send them to you but um but it's funny because um when you get the in like when you see the japanese and that what they're working on and the handcrafting that they're doing with it, it it is interesting when people talk about japanese steel versus actually being hand forged in japan and until we got into the into the business of scissors we didn't really understand exactly what that meant and there's a huge difference between Japanese steel and actually being hand forged in Japan because of what you were talking about before about the craftsmanship that we've all known to come and love in Japan. So it's been uh, it's been it's been interesting to yeah. to understand that more and uh, um, and you know I want to go over someday. You know what I mean? I, I think it would be amazing to go over. I still have never been to Asia, like which I think is even crazier. I've yeah I've never been to Asia. I know it. I know. I know. I was invited to come over. We were supposed to go over. Actually, there were three places. I was supposed to go to Russia. I was supposed to go to um, I would love to go Israel, yeah. and then also um, to yeah. China. And all three of them, I was being invited to come over. All three of them have been eliminated because of uh, of everything that's happened. Well, the first one, mm -hmm. Israel, was because of the Iran, the Iranian, um, the the plane that blew up in Iran. So Rock and Oil was bringing us over there to Israel to see the factory and the whole bit. I was so excited. And then that happened and they had to cancel it and the other two because of this, you know? So yeah, yeah. I know I hate it when you see like yeah. on your, on your, that when hope, you see hope. something that says, that says like when it pops up on your screen that you're flying home from Italy today in, you know, like it pops up <laughs> reminding you that you're flying home today because your flight information. Yeah. Is, and it's made me really sad that, um, that we can't, it's been great to be in one place. Like you said, that actually, 
that's the, it, there's nothing, if there's one good thing about it, it's being able to slow down long enough to just take a breath. Cause after being on planes for 30 years at this kind of pace, um, at 54, yeah. it, I agree with you that, and, and I've been so much in solitude here that nature has had such a huge impact. It always has had an impact on me in such a big way. Um, but it, it has been a blessing to be off of a plane for five weeks. Yeah. And I, I agree. Feel the same I agree. Way. I know you feel the same um, way. I feel the same way. Um, Mandy, one of the um, um, audience asked, have I been back to Vietnam? I actually have not been back to Vietnam. You haven't. I'm, no, I'm dying to come back. I want to go back with my sister. Oh. And I really want to go back with my sister because my sister knows like, you know, the um, villages and stuff that, you know, that we grew up with and stuff like that. And she, I want her to take me there. But every time I come like, hey, hey, let's go this year. She's like, no, no, no. And she's just so like, I don't have to like really drag her one day because she knows a lot of things. And I want to go back with her because she, she knows those things. Bring but, them out, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I think if I do go back, it's going to be such a an emotional emotional experience because I know I'm going to cry because every time I see images of like Vietnam and like the war and stuff like that it just brings me back to tears and it's just like do you, you know do you remember but, um, it do you remember being there not really at all mm -mm, yeah. nothing nothing I don't think my memory my memory my memory start in the U.S. so after, when I was six years old wow is that crazy? I don't I, remember anything from past six. Which you should. No, so I mean before I, six. So I wonder if that's if that's trauma that's that's not allowing you to remember that. Probably. For sure. Yeah. For sure. I, do I want to open it? I don't know. I don't. I'm I'm okay. Like I don't. Do I need to open it? I don't know. I don't think so. so it, welcome to, welcome yeah. to Mary's life. <laughs> and I said I I wrote, I wrote so many times on my Instagram about like I'm good. My sister. So I have an identical twin sister, and uh, and so uh, yeah, we both had some trauma growing up, and um, and we she unfortunately had to deal with it way earlier than I did. Fortunately, unfortunately, and she kept saying to me. Mary, like, and I go, and I would, she's like, you need to start, like, like, it's going to catch up to you. And I'm like, I'm good. I got this. I'm good. And then it did, it did catch up to me. And I'm like, she knocked down, she knocked the door, not kept knocking on the door. And I kept like not answering this time. She like knocked the door down, like she kicked it down and I had to deal with it. And um, so you'll, it will be the, you know, it, it will happen in the right time. And, um, yeah. and if there are things in your life that you like, it's amazing to me how different I feel like I am today than I even was a year ago because I was able to work through things I didn't even know I needed to work through, if that makes sense. Like, I didn't even know what those things were. And, um, and onsite mm -hmm. uh, really was mm. a place that allowed me. I did a week of group counseling, um, and we had writers from HBO there. Like, we had it's a very creative place. But it's super powerful. So it was a week of uh, group therapy and then a week, and nobody does this. I think I was the only one in their history that ever did it. And they're like, this is not a good idea. I had never been to therapy one time in my whole life, by the way. I had not ever been to any therapy, not mm. one session. So, of course, I go all in <clears throat> and go to a place. And then for a week after that, I had a week of therapy one on one with my own therapist that they flew in specifically for me. And that's what they do. They fly in these different people with different specialties, which is make, what makes it so amazing. And then I took, I worked on the things that I learned about that first week. On um, my second week, working with a, a, a counselor, literally eight hours a day, just the two of us for five days. And um, and I learned things about myself that were so deep inside about the way I behave when I'm walking down a. Um, uh, you don't. Even, these are things you don't even know. On like you're walking down like. Um, uh, you're walking in the cosmetic section and you always, I would always go around that section. And I just didn't realize that I did that because of just mm. how unattractive I felt and how self, so much self-loathing that I've had in my life. Mm. I didn't even realize, and it has a lot to do with, uh, not my parents, there's not, not my parents, there's other traumas that I have with uh, other, other things and relatives and stuff. And um, I never realized that I did that. I never realized that I would always do that um, because I of just the some of the treatment and the bullying that I had when I was really little about you know you're so ugly and you're not worthy and so I had this whole like 
lack of worthiness feeling that I still am working on, but I didn't even realize why I wouldn't get down. I, I, I just, it was so ingrained in me or why I won't open presents when people are standing there because I was heavily shamed mm. by, as a child um, from a, a rich uh, relative that would buy my sister and me like really like nothing gifts and then make us open them in front of the rest of our relatives and other kids that were getting really shitty stuff. And so mm -hmm. I don't open presents in front of people and I never knew why. And so I had to go deep inside to find out the why. And so it's, it's really, um, because I just, uh, because you, you go on autopilot, right? So when you go on autopilot, mm -hmm. you don't even know why you're doing it. You just do it. And, so you have to go really deep and they get you really deep in a really like safe, cool, amazing space um, of an hour away from Nashville. And it's the most beautiful place. Everybody's in gorgeous cabins with fireplaces. It's like, it's incredible. And I never thought that I could, I never thought I had a problem until the problem hit me. And then I didn't know how much I needed that counseling to get these things so I could even understand why these things were on autopilot inside my mind. So. I always, I recommend to everyone, this place is, um, it, it certainly changed my life and it opened up things and gave me strategies to be able to work through them. Um, and it was a, it, it was an amazing uh, place, you know, to go. So, and, and like I said, I, I know that's like so sad when people say, you know, like getting shamed by your own, you know, relatives or whatever. There's, you know, a history of step grandparents and just like, just different things, you know. So um, things happen, you know, we grow up, everybody's got some level of trauma and it's things that we all need to, yeah. you know, understand and give ourselves, you know, some love. And we can't, if we don't love ourselves, it's really hard to love other people. And um, we need to, uh, you know, so I, it, will, it will happen at some point. I suspect that that's exactly yeah. why, but it will happen and it yeah. will hope, hopefully happen in a time where you can positively express that, you know what I mean? So yes. It's all about timing. It, I think it is all about timing. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough that I had a team that could run the company literally for a year without me. And maybe, maybe my, wow. may, maybe, yeah. In fact, it was a blessing in disguise because they then had to step up because I wasn't there to make decisions. I physically struggled to make decisions um, in my work. And so when you work 80 hours a week for 30 years and everybody expects you to be the leader and the strength <clears throat> and you can't be the strength anymore, it taught them that they could run the company without me and they could make good decisions. So it was a, a huge blessing in disguise for me as it related to that. But, um, yeah. but you know, like- thank, thank you, thank you to the team. Yes, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. and you know, I yeah. mean, you're, you know, we're it, like, it, I think that maybe my, maybe whatever that was knew it was time to fall apart, you know, that, okay, it's yeah. okay. Things around you are not gonna fall apart. So it's okay if you fall apart now. Do you know what I mean? So um, I think that maybe maybe is you know why that was able to happen. So yeah, and now here yeah. we are. My great, I know. Now here we are. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I we don't we I, don't I need really, our own I, traumas when the world throws one <laughs> upon us that that we're all in it together. So there's 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 strength, I suppose, in that, right? There's strength, and then and and keeping your mental health is so important. And I think sometimes that we work out so much and all that stuff, but keeping this, it's really hard. And it's like keeping that sane is sometimes the most difficult thing. And oh, like you said, I think one day I will open up that can of warm that I've been, you know, don't know if I need it or not. And, and then, you know, I agree with you. And then sometimes you don't know if you need it yeah. until that happens. So it's, I think it's yeah. easy when you're, when you're running so hard. And I always tell everybody, you know, people like run hard when you're young, like for sure, run hard, yeah. follow your dreams, run hard. Like, because as you get older, you have family and kids and house payments and all of that, like take risks when you're young, you know? I think that the, that's the best time to take it. I started my first company when I was 22 and I've never worked for anybody since then. And you know, those people say, how could you take a risk so young? Well, that's the best time to take one. You don't have anything. No, I've had nothing. nothing to lose. I had a, yep. I had a, I, I thought that I had won the lottery when I had my first apartment and they left a sofa there that like smelled like cat pee and had like cat hair all over it. And I thought I'd won the lottery because I didn't have to buy a sofa, you know, or dig it out of the, you know, it's like, it's, it's crazy. And I, you know, and I took, I, you take, I took risks then and it's allowed me after a lot of hard work to get to where I am today. 
I'd be really hard to take that kind of a risk today. You know what I mean? So, um, so what are you going to do? So now we've got, we're back <clears throat> to the salon world. You've got an amazingly successful salon in, are you, you guys are in Beverly Hills, right? Is it Beverly Hills or what? Yes, Hollywood? we are. Yeah. Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. So now what? A couple of weeks from now, you guys will have the ability to go back to work, right? Yes. Yes. You have to take the precaution. You know, I think, you know, and, and right now is the best time to stock up. If yeah. you can, like, stock up on masses and um, uh, wipes and um, sanitation, um, you know, cleanings and um, can, can maybe gloves as well. Can you get them there? Huh? Can you get them in California? Are they still out? Like the disinfectant and all of that? We could. You guys can't. They're still out. Or they're still out. They're still out. Wow. Wow. They're still out. But you, you, should, you should check up on it. Yes, exactly. We check up on... Um, our supplies all the time you just have to check up on it and yes. you know even ask them like hey when did you guys get restocked and then know that when it gets restocked just be there and stuff like that so it's it's just one thing that we have to do you know we can't it's just the way it is so it is what it is and i think taking as a strive with that and you just then you don't think too much emotionally into it you just have to do it yeah and i think that's how i have to do with you know everything and you know especially now so and I think, you know, those of you guys that have been with me quite a lot, um, you know, talking to people like Ann and Nick Arrojo, a lot of the salon owners, um, you know, we, we and everybody comes on at night with me and we all sit and talk about like how we're feeling, um, what's happening, when are things going to open back up, are they not going to open back up? And I think, as I said last night, you know, this is the most complicated situation to ever advise anyone on because we're, we are stuck in a situation where you know, as I was saying, like, I can tell you how to get off your ass and follow your dream. I can tell you, I can try to inspire you to believe in yourself. I can do those things. But it's hard because we know that there are many of you that your, your states are going to start opening up. And, um, and you're, you may be afraid so, to go back to work. And I think the one thing that on you and I were talking about earlier that I think, you know, um, we should just, just maybe openly talk about and you shared something with me about you know um that uh, i'll get to that in a second so i just want to say, make this statement is we're all right now in a situation where there are people that say don't go you don't go back to work you're hurting people there are people that say i need to go back to work because i need to make a living i need to feed my kids i think that if there's one thing that i think i could ask you and i think that that um that on probably feels the same way let's be kind to each other and let's make sure that we don't judge each other for the decisions that we each individually need to make for the benefit of our own families right now. And I know, on you were telling me earlier that um, that uh, that you know some people that are doing house calls. And they said, how do you feel about that? And I, I want you to answer that question because I think it's an important thing for everybody to hear. Well, I think, I mean, in their situation, they have to feed their family, yeah. you know, and they have, they have means that they have to do. And I really think that just as long as you take the precaution, exactly. like, you know, wear your mask, you know, blah, blah, and don't have a lot of people in the room. And then, you know, you know, maybe buy that thermal gun with you. Um, not that, is it thermal? Ah, <laughs> the <laughs> thermometer. Thermometer. <laughs> it looks like a gun, I'm, but I'm, thermometer. I, I see a meme. I see a meme coming. I don't know. I just, I feel like there's a meme coming. I don't know. I just, this is just a Okay. <laughs> thermometer. Just, just make sure that, you know, I, just to, just to check you know yeah. and i think if you take the precaution really be safe about it i don't you know if you really have to feed your family not everyone is fortunate not everyone is you know you, you do what you have to do and i really I feel like there's no judgment in that exactly. you can't judge someone for that and also everyone has such different background yeah as far as like you know you don't know their stories like you know listen to them out but just as long they take the precaution Yes. That's all. And like, I think that's, that's very, very important. You know, people are saying, well, that's not social distancing. Well, guess what? In the state of Georgia, um, on Friday, um, the idea of social distancing goes right out the window. And in your state, it will be not, yeah. not your state, but in everybody's state. So this idea of social distancing, yeah. this is where I personally believe and I get on my soapbox about we've got to stop judging people. This virus will not, it will not magically go away tomorrow or the next day. So we are gonna go back to work in this environment. And if people feel like, if people have enough money and they can stay home and they wanna stay home, then they should stay home. That if that's what they're, that they, they're comfortable with. 
But if their state is opening up and their salon can open back up, I literally will, I'll, I'll go after anybody that goes after the people that are going back to work because they have to feed their families. Like, and there are, do you know how many people, there's a big survey that we have going out right now that literally says that's all about how much longer are you, I mean, one of our questions is about your level of like desperation. Like, are you desperate? Are you literally feeding? Can you pay? Are, are you saving money for food right now and not paying your rent? In our mind, that's desperate. Are you not good? Like, I've got money for rent and I've got money for food, but that's it. Like, and it's going to run out. Like, so we want, we want to send that back out to national again. And I think that, and then are you going to go back? Are, are you not afraid? I'm going to go back. I can't wait to get back. Are you kind of afraid and you don't want to go back, but you have to go back because you have to feed your family? Like, this is what this survey coming out is going to be all about. And I think that it's, you know, and when people allow you to do house calls, then guess what? You can do house calls. It's, as I was saying, I'm not judging anyone for being legal or not, but we also know that tomorrow, if now you can do house calls, okay, you can do house calls. Have you ever speeded at, you know, have you ever, have you ever gone past the speed limit? Like, I think we need to be a little bit less judgmental and a little bit more, um, because I'm sure that you probably have speed. Understanding. Yeah, a little bit more understanding of and a little bit more thoughtful of the people that have to work because the government doesn't have any money and they don't have a brother, a sister, a mother, a father that can give them money. They have to have food. And uh, I think that that's yeah. the really, really um, uh, exciting. I'm going to get a new job yeah. because I have asthma. And, and, going to be a risk and, and, and I have to say, just, I, saying, just follow your guideline. Yes, yeah. exactly. And I think, um, I, I do think that we may see, and if that means that people feel uncomfortable about going back in and then they go find a different profession, I hope that's not the case. But I do understand if people are sick, you know, and I think that the most important thing that you guys can do right now is I think you can communicate with your clients. So the first thing you should do is start talking to them, DMing them. How are they doing? Do they still have a job? How are they feeling? And then how are they feeling about coming back to the salon? I think it's really important that you guys communicate with your clients and then communicate with your hairdressers that work in your salons as well and find out how they feel find out what's going to make them comfortable coming back into the salon again that communication is key right now because it will help you know how many clients you're going to have when you open your doors back back up again and then also it will help you determine how you need to move forward are you going to have to do house calls for older you know, for older clients. And how are you going to do that? And are you going to be double booking? Probably not, as you and I were talking about earlier. You can't double book. No. So, mm -mm. you know, how are for you me, gonna, no. You know, we no. talked, yeah, how are you going to keep the space between people? You know, and yeah. if you're a really busy salon, can you afford to be six feet or do you have to put some sort of subdivider? So the thing that is important is right now we can be spending time thinking about how we're going to go back instead of spending time thinking about how we're not or like just sitting there going what are we going to do because i think the reality is is that the government's not going to take care of everybody for a year so we're going to have to figure out what 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 we're going to do and maybe there will yeah. be help or support from the government for certain industries that do that are in the business of touching people you know that could be true i i, I just don't know but at this point yeah. we uh we don't know exactly what's happening and i think you said it earlier we just have to pay attention to what's going on in our counties and our states, especially counties, which is interesting because yep. in our state, yep. there's yep. not, there's been, for no us is county. Of, yeah. In our state, there's been no yeah. discussion of counties. It's all been statewide, which is crazy because I'm in the middle of nowhere and Chicago is, you know, is Chicago is downtown Chicago. So, um, you know, it's good. What other things are you guys thinking about that you're going to do in your salon? Um, have you been talking to your clients and your team and how are they feeling? Well, my clients, they've been asking, they're like, can you do house calls? I have not done anything. I have not worked ever since um, mid-March. So I still don't feel, you know, that I just want to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm listening to the news, like as far as like right. our county and our, our states and stuff like that. Then I feel a little more, um, you know, better about things and stuff like that. Then I'll take precaution. You know, we do have guidelines that um, our governor, our governor has given us, so oh, I want to follow that. You do, yeah, okay. and I'll send that. To, I'll send that to you, yeah, um, Mary, and then yeah, yeah, that would be great. And then for for state of California and stuff like that, um, I I just think we honestly every I hate this feeling, but like it's just you have to play day by day and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that is just like don't don't get into a whole 
into of like that whining, you know, and and so get yourself into that self black pity. hole. So like, just like over the self yeah. pity, we can all feel self pity for like I did for probably a week, um, because you know we're all suffering. I mean, we have you know huge yeah. huge contracts with clients that are being canceled, like, and I still have thirty five people on, and I was not one of the ones that got funded uh, for the PPP program. So. You know, that's, uh, it's, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, we all have the right to do it, but not for long, like we need to step up. And I think that reading and learning and, um, you know, on BTCU, we took all of our, um, all of our lives that we had, and we put them all together and people can get those free for three days, and then they can, um, they get them for a dollar a day. So we like tried to take all of our uh, lives and do that, you know, just to try to help people learn. Because I feel like if we learn, you've been giving tons of free education on your page, which is great. You've done a lot of lives, yeah. haven't you? You've done. I try. Yeah, I, 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 I think this is a good time to speak to your community. You know, I have like professional. I also have clients on it. So, you know, clients, I give free consultation, and then along with that, they get products for Melbourne. So I send them a gift package of like that's shampoo, awesome. conditioner, and also um, styling products. So I think that's one thing that Melbourne is helping, you know, me to help my clients. Um, and then I, you know, give like, you know, tutorials on like how to do hair and then with my educators stuff like that. I'm trying, you know, I think I'm trying to keep busy. And I think that's one thing that we can do yeah. as of now, you know, well, and then it, I, I agree completely. And I also think, you know, there's been like, we talk about a lot of uh, you know, um, hairdressers that are teaching people how to cut hair and um, all of that. And I think that the most, or root touch-up kits where some people say that's not professional. I think whatever, you know, Arnie Miller, who was the founder of Matrix said to me once, I said, how do you make decisions? And he said, we only ask ourselves one question, is it good for a hairdresser? And I would say that back to all the hairdressers in the world is, is it good for your client? So if your client doesn't, if your client doesn't want to walk around with gray hair, um, you know, because, or even be on Zoom calls with gray hair, I don't think it's in our best interest or, and I don't even think it's fair to say, um, you know, uh, like wait for me until you, that's not fair. You're not their client, they're your client. And they, it's not okay to say, you know, just stay gray on those Zoom calls because I expect you to, or I need you to, or whatever. I think it's okay to, to give them the root touch-up kit and to teach them how to do the T-zone so they don't, so, you know, and it's also okay if people want to dress up in their uh, full on, like they're going to just, you know, they're going to a business meeting and sit, you know, in, you know, at a, at a chair and be on a Zoom meeting that way too. I, I think it's important that we, that we allow our clients, you know, to learn how to do that if they need to, they're going to come back to you. They definitely want to come back to you, but we need to help them in like in a time where they're not feeling so great either. There's nothing like feeling you feel so much better when you your hair looks beautiful and when you have great color. And so we know that there's a lot of clients looking really gray and not feeling great about themselves. And the least we can do is say, I wanna help you feel better, so I'm gonna help you do this. And I think that that's, you know, a lot of hairdressers I think feel the same way. Um, I think we need to help clients that need the support. Like that's what it's all about. I don't know. That's why so many people got into the business, I feel like, you know? Yeah. So it's- uh, Yeah, yeah. It feels, it feels good. And again, I mean, yeah. And then again, with, with all these things, like guidelines, it's just like, you know, they don't, it's hard to do your hair, you know? Oh, I my burned God. my neck the other day, curling my own hair, <laughs> you know? And it's like, yeah, I put a wig on. And I'm like, oh, I get it now. I understand how clients, you know, you know, it's just like me asking my dentist, like, hey, how do I clean my own teeth? Or how do I get my own extraction? And I think, I, and I think no. the idea is just so. to get them through until they can see you again. You know what yep. I mean? And I yep. think that's what it's really all about. Just to get them through so they can see you again. Mm -hmm. I don't think any anybody that can afford to sit in your chair wants to sit in your chair. This is not just about, you know, learning how to do their hair. This is like, they have to. Like, they're stuck right now. They're not going to somebody else. They're not trying to learn the online tutorial because they can't come to you. Like they just can't come to yeah. you. So they're desperate. And, and mm -hmm. so the second that they come back, you know, they're, they're coming back because they need to, they want to sit in your chair because you do it better than anyone else. And because they miss you. And that's such an important yep. part of their life, you know? So I, I, and I think most hairdressers are feeling that way today that they understand yeah. why, um, why, so many hairdressers are trying to help their clients right now. I think in the beginning it was weird and scary, but it's been on gone. It's gone on long enough that people I think are very understanding of their clients 
knowing that they're gray now. <laughs> like they're truly gray. There's no question. It's been five <laughs> weeks. They're gray, you know. So but anyway, this has been like, so awesome to spend uh, time with you. I miss you. Yeah, I miss you too. Air hugs. Air hugs. I know, I know. <laughs> Big kiss. Like I know. It's just uh I, I wanted to share I'm thank you for sharing so many personal things about your past. I oh. I I just wanted people to know that you know um that you had to go through a really difficult time in your childhood and um and look where you are today. You know, you your whole family had to risk so much and you know, you could be bitter and all of those things and yet you're completely the opposite. You know, you're grateful and um you know and continue to work hard and the one thing is, is that we may be in a situation when we all go back that we, just like the 2008 recession in 2000, is we may have to work twice as hard to make half the money. And it's really true. Mm -hmm. We might have to. Um, but that's just what we do. You know, it's like, it's mm -hmm. just, we just got to dig in and, um, and have that strength and, and know that uh, all of these things, that, and also take advantage of the time like you've been doing too. And I've been hearing this from a lot of people take advantage of the time that you're at home and you may never get that time. You're never going to get that time back. And even though it feels hard to be thankful no. for it, it's uh, it's, there's so much great opportunity to spend that time, you know, just taking stock of our lives and thinking about what we want to do as we move forward. And I just think it's uh, a great opportunity and yeah. you're such an inspiration, um, you know, to this industry. Oh. You uh, too, Mary. And a good, you know what? A good guy finishes first, and there's nothing that is more wonderful than, than watching that because uh, you really yeah. are such a genuine, wonderful human being, and giving yeah. and uh, loving, and that's why the the industry and me love you so much. So Aww. I want to thank, thank you, Mary. You. Love you too. I do. I love you too. And then we'll see you next Monday for social climbing. Yeah, we're really excited yep. about that. And um, thank you again. Thank great you. To see you. Lots yes. of love. And I can't wait to see you at the BTC house again. We'll have dinner and we'll uh, No, one day. I know. And some wine. I know. I know. Anyway, I'll talk to you soon. Thank Thanks you, so Mary. Thank, Thanks, you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.